Please give a warm welcome to Jovan Zivanovic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome to my presentation about uh, reverse vending machine exploits. This is a project that I have been uh, conducting with my two colleagues, Manu Leitner and Dimitri Simos. And let's get into it. So what will I talk about now? Um, first of all, I want to give you the motivation why I think that this topic is interesting and the security here should be taken seriously. Next, we're going over quickly how these machines work, how they, uh, for one, uh, detect which bottles are correct, which they should accept, and secondly, how they uh, print out the receipts, how the whole process works. Uh, then we take a look at attacks that have been used against these machines, talk about an attack that we uh, found out. Uh, we discuss the story reaction after uh, publishing this, after disclosing this vulnerability to them, and we also, before concluding this talk, take a look at uh, the reverse vending machines in another country. So, why is this topic in interesting? Well, first of all, generally, financial topics where you exchange goods for money are interesting because if implemented incorrectly, you get free money, which as an attacker is nice, but as a store owner is not that good. So, uh, another point is also that Austria plans to extend its uh, reverse vending machine infrastructure, adding machines for uh, plastic bottles and also for cans. So the infrastructure will get bigger and this topic is also then relevant. Okay, how does this process uh, look like? I think most of you are familiar with this. You take your empty bottle, put it in the machine on the conveyor belt, it takes the bottle, you press a button, get a receipt, take the receipt to a cash register. Uh, you can get the money in cash or you just deduct it from your uh, bought purchase, uh, purchased item total. Yes. Okay, so how do these machines uh, detect the correct bottle and how do they differentiate between bottles and, for example, something else? In the most uh, simplest uh, form, they use a barcode scanner. The simplest machine is simply, uh, we also have those in Vienna. Um, it's a big box. It has three cylinders where you put your bottle into. It starts rotating those cylinders, the barcode scanner, captures the barcode and compares it against a white list that it has and accepts the bottle then. However, it can be also more complex like material detection using a spectrometer or even a shape detection by using a camera over the conveyor belt uh, and simply comparing the shape of the bottle to trained uh, bottle shapes. Uh, another important uh, detection sensor is the weight which uh, usually is used to prevent people from simply taking bottles from the store and putting them directly into the machine without paying first. And yeah, and some machines also use a combination of multiple of these uh, attributes. Okay, so how can we exploit this? What attacks have already been performed against vending machines? Um, I captured them, I categorized them into different categories. Uh, for example, first we have the inside attacks or machine manipulation. This is generally the category where you find the most creative uh, methods for scamming these machines. For example, I linked some articles. Uh, there was a person that was using a fishing line attached to a bottle, putting it into the uh, machine, waiting for it to be accepted and then simply pulling it out and doing that again. If I remember correctly, according to an article, he made like 20,000 euros, which shows commitment to the, to the scam. Okay, but usually in this topic, uh, in this category of attacks, it's usually um, employees that change the configuration of such a machine or um, manipulate the usual pipeline of the machine. So, when you um, return a plastic bottle, for example, usually they get shredded. First of all, in order to prevent you from reusing that bottle, uh, to resubmit it to a machine, and second of all, to simply um, have more space to store more bottles. However, uh, there was an example, that, uh, an article where two men in Germany made over 100K uh, by simply disabling this shredding feature of the machine 
letting those bottles accumulate and then using them two to three times again into the machine, uh, throwing them into the machine. Yeah. But however, these attacks are usually quickly to spot because for some reason the people get greedy and go for big, big, big sums that you usually won't get from refunds, uh, from re bottle returns. But yeah. Then we have attacks on the bottle acceptance system, which is, in the simplest case, trivial if only a barcode scanner is used. Um, if only a barcode scanner is used, as I said, it only checks the barcode. So it does not prevent you from taking, for example, again, an article, a toilet paper roll, and simply sticking a barcode on it from a bottle and throwing that into the machine. Um, attacks of this type usually try to, to trick the machine into accepting stuff that should not be accepted, that, is not, uh, that are not bottles or cans. Um, usually what they do is they collect, um, what they can do is they collect bottles from another country that are not accepted in, in another country, and they simply stick the local um, barcodes of the accepted bottles over these imported bottles and throw them into the machine. Uh, the next category is the attack against the bottle classification. Here, our goal is to submit or to give the machine a bottle, for example, but make the machine believe that the bottle is not a bottle, but something more worth. For example, I think for a bottle you get like glass bottle nine to 15 cents. And for a crate, those plastic crates, you get a lot more like 15 euro, I'm not too sure, but it's more. And the goal of this attack would be to submit a bottle and make it be worth 15 euros. This is technically very difficult to do if no camera is used um, or no AI is used to classify the bottle. If it's only, a, uh, for example, I don't know, if it's weight combined with barcode and IR spectrometer, it could be difficult to trick this, but this type of text still exists. Okay, there is one more thing that you can attack uh, with these machines, the receipts. So what did we do? We collected from uh, free store chains in Vienna different receipts. Um, I have some here. These are from one store. We, bought, uh, we brought uh, one bottle back twice and we got these receipts. And as you can see in the middle, do you see the mouse? No. Um, if you see, if you look in the middle, you can see that those two barcodes, the numbers under the barcodes do not match. They are different, which is generally good. If we take a look at another store, we can see a different behavior. We see, again, three receipts, three different times, I think, uh, yeah, two different dates, uh, Again, one bottle returned, but you see that the receipts are identical, except of the time stamp. The barcode is the same. Interesting. And the third store is similar to the first store. It uses dynamic barcodes, which means uh, from barcode to barcode, the number is different, but it, um, it still has a, some problems that we can talk about uh, later. Okay, so if we compare these receipts, we see that uh, store two all look the same. Store one and store three are dynamic. So if the receipts all look the same, we probably can do a replay attack, meaning I can take my nine cent receipt, put it on a copier, copy it a hundred times, and I have suddenly nine euros, and I can go with that to a store. But that's not that practical. If we look at the structure of one of those receipts, we can see that it has a name, it has an address, it has the receipt number, which uh, is on the top right. We see the credit score that you get, or the amount of money that you get, the barcode and the timestamp. The barcode consists of 13 digits, which is a Jan 13 barcode. Um, which is uh, structured as follows. The first two uh, digits represent the country code. The next five digits represent the manufacturer, generally the store. Next five digits 
uh, represent the product code, and then you have a checksum simply to, uh, for error checking. If you look now in the product code, which is highlighted green, you can see that we have an 0083 there. Accidentally, we also get 83 cents back. And if we now go back to those receipts, we can see that, ignore the last digit, the five, we see we have 0009, which could lead to something. Okay, so knowing all this, we wrote a simple Python script. We bought a, a thermal printer for like, I think, 10 euros, connected everything, uh, two bottles of mate, 15 minutes of working, and you get a prototype where you can print identical receipts with custom amounts of money on them. Now the interesting question, does this actually work? It does. You can print your own receipts, go to the store, and they won't look at you anyway. It, it depends. If you go to a store with 100 euros in <laughs> return bottles, it will be difficult to explain to them why you haven't been standing half an hour at the return machine. But I'm, I'm guessing some social engineering will take care of that. Okay. So, after knowing this, we talked to the manufacturer of those machines, who informed us that the machines have a way to create uh, secure receipts. However, the, their customer has to agree to that, which apparently the supermarket said no. Then we informed the supermarket, and we got one of the best answers in incident uh, disclosure. We know who will exploit it. We will do it in the future. We will switch to a safe system, which is cool with me. But yeah, if you have the option to secure your infrastructure or to simply say, yes, I will take this machine, but make it secure, please do that. OK, so after doing this research, uh, we also started looking at related work from other uh, researchers, and we found one paper, which is very interesting, that did the same research on Danish supermarkets, and they found basically the same thing with them. I think they even found one more vulnerability because they use very old machines, but it is apparently a rather known issue. OK, knowing this, let's take a look at another country. How is the bottle return in another country? So we um, looked at Finland, at Helsinki, and they recycle a lot. From what I've seen, if you stand at a cash register with a 20 euro receipt, it's normal. It's considered normal, it's not unusual. So do they have the same problems as we do? They do. They print static barcodes for returned bottles, which means you can, again, exploit the same issue. You can. You have to change the logo of the supermarket, but the code is simply the same. But it gets better. So they import a lot of stuff. And I found, for example, um, I think it was a soda that's imported from Estonia. And the interesting thing is that above, uh, below the, the usual barcode is sticked over with another sticker, with a new barcode, which also says, 20 cents. So what happens if you take this barcode and put it on a 10 cent bottle and return both of them? What do you get? Well, the bottle without the sticker, which has the Estonian uh, barcode printed on it, is worth zero dollars for the uh, machine. However, the 10 cent bottle with the 20 cent sticker is worth 20 cent, which leads me to believe that you can take this sticker, copy it a bunch of times, put it on 10 cents bottles, uh, 10 cent bottles, or potentially bottles that are not even accepted, and get more money for it. OK, so knowing all this, how difficult is it to make the system secure? Technically, it's not that difficult. They generally do the following. When a machine prints a receipt, 
the receipt is sent to some sort of cloud, some sort of database. And when you use the receipt at the, um, <clears throat> sorry, at the cache register, the cache register queries the cloud or the database and simply checks if this receipt exists there. And also the important thing is to create dynamic receipts. For example, uh, let me just go way back to here. Um, for example, these receipts are, we didn't uh, try to exploit them because we thought they would be probably secure because you can see the, uh, the receipt number is part of the barcode. So this is the dynamic part of the barcode and this could mean that it is actually uh, stored in a centralized database and is validated. So we didn't test it out for the, this, uh, this store with these receipts, but we, um, we plan to try this in the future. Okay, so after we know how to mitigate this problem, after we know how to exploit this problem, what did we learn here? Not much. Use secure systems if you are given the opportunity and don't use receipt. There are countries, I don't have an example right now in my head, but there are countries where you basically uh, can get the, uh, get the, instead of the receipt, you get an email or something on your smartphone which reduces paper waste and also is potentially more secure. Yeah, this was my talk. Thank you for your attention and hope you have questions. Thank you very much, Joran. Now, do we have questions from the audience? Yes. One question in the back. So, in theory, all those systems are still in place. Is that correct? <laughs> they are in place practically. They are really in place still. Okay, thank you for the yeah. information. <laughs> <laughs> but please, please be responsible. So not just in, in Austria, but probably also uh, in, yeah. in, in whole Europe? Yeah. Or yeah. Wow. So to recap, what is the equipment that one needs? Um, you can ask me in the, in the break. <laughs> okay. But it's very cost efficient. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. And how, how much time did, did it take you to create these fake receipts? To have a prototype that looks almost like the exact, uh, like the original receipt, it took like I think half an hour or something. But the problem is uh, making it look identical because of the spacing. This took I think probably an hour more. So, <laughs> so yeah. Do we have additional questions here? So then I guess there will be a lot of guys in the break uh, approaching you <laughs> to get more information. Then uh, let's uh, thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Thank you.